In our previous session, our heroes found themselves unexpectedly confronted by a patrol of guards. This fateful encounter was sparked by a near miss, as an arrow from one of the guards' bows whistled dangerously close to Goba. Unyielding, Tronald stepped forward, resolute in his quest for justice and a sincere apology. Yet between the party's demands for contrition and Goba's signature cheeky retorts, the air grew thick with tension. Just when it seemed you were parting ways, the guard's true intent came to light. A deadly rain of arrows was unleashed, and in that cruel moment, Goba met a tragic end. Seething with rage, Tronald retaliated, conjuring a devastating fireball that absolutely obliterated the guards and deliberately shattered the prisoner's cage. Amid the embers and ashes, a new ally emerged. Lunaria. A stalwart guardian of her woodland realm, she found herself imprisoned for standing against poachers who threatened her cherished wildlife. Though her story was captivating, it was the arcane power she held, a scroll of Ray's dead, that truly ensnared the group's focus. Now with Lunaria united with the party, a grave choice looms on the horizon. Do you channel the scroll's magic to resurrect Goba or keep it in reserve, anticipating the perils that surely lie ahead? Have you made your choice then, Tronald? What do you want to do? Yeah, I'm gonna use the scroll to bring Goba back. Whatever, man, if that's your choice. Yeah, it is. All right, Lunaria, would you mind handing me the scroll? Yeah, of course. Here you go. Thank you. All right, Joe, I'm going to unfurl the scroll before reading out its incantations and using it on Goba. Okay, I'm going to need you to make an ability check using your spellcasting ability, which is intelligence. The DC would usually be 15, seen as the raised dead spell is level 5, but because this spell isn't in your spell list, the DC is going to be 18. Nice, I rolled a natural 19, so that's a 22 total. Tronald, as you delicately unfurl the scroll of Ray's dead, the very air around you and your companions seems to tremble. The parchment reveals handwritten runes, which, bathed in a faint luminescence, begin to move and dance as if they were alive, beckoning to unleash the dormant power contained within. As you begin to read the incantation, vibrant weaves of green energy spring forth, emerging from the scroll and reaching for Goba's lifeless form. They don't merely surround him, they pierce into him, intertwining with the very fibers of his being. As these tendrils infiltrate Goba's body, they encounter the arrow shafts that brought his end. Rather than forcefully extracting them, the green energy seeps into the wooden shafts, rotting them from the inside. Like trees withering away in an accelerated passage of time, the arrows decay until they crumble away, leaving no trace of their once prominent existence. Suspended in this green embrace, Goba begins to levitate. The tendrils, having done their task, start to form a luminous cocoon around him. The intensity of the light within the cocoon grows, becoming almost blinding. A few moments pass before the cocoon's radiance begins to wane. Slowly it unravels, and the tendrils, instead of returning to the now powerless scroll, absorb into Goba. And then, with a gasp, Goba breathes. His eyes flutter open as life courses through him once again. Hey Goba, you're back! Me noggin's all fuzzy-like! Last thing me felt was a sharp sting in me back and then just darkness. What's been going on? You were killed by the guards, Gobba. They shot a bunch of arrows into you and made you look like a pincushion. So, well, long story short, Tronald killed them all. Then we met Lunaria. She gave Tronald a magical scroll to which he brought you back to life with it. Oi, Tronald, you went through all that ruckus for little old Gobba. You're damn right I did. I've just about had it with people making judgments against individuals before they know the first thing about them. Tronald, I ain't got the words, you know. Boss Goblin wouldn't have done that for any of us, and he's been bossing us around since forever. And here you are, barely knowing me a wink, and you go saving my hide. You're a strange big un, Tronald. That settles it. You're me new boss now. Forget old boss. He ain't got nothing on you. Oh my God. Wow, well, that's very kind of you, Gaba. But I don't want you to think you're lesser than us. So I will be your boss, but only under one condition. And what condition will that be, eh? That you view all of us as your equals. Equals? You? You really mean it, Tronald? No one's ever, I mean, goblins always get the short end of the stick, you know? We're always under someone's boot or just another target for an arrow. Never thought I'd see the day someone, let alone a big old human like you, would call Gobba an equal. It's... it's a bit much for old Gobba's heart. You truly are something else, boss. All right, deal's a deal. Let's do this. 
as equals. What what just happened? Did you miss it, Alexandru? Gobba has chosen to see Tronald as his new leader. In return, Tronald has shown him that he's no less than any of us, embracing him as our equal. It's actually really quite adorable. No, I didn't miss it. It was a rhetorical question. Oh, gotcha. So what will Tronald being your new boss entail for you, Gobba? Let me think. First, reckon I'll be on boot shining duty. Get Tronald's boots all sparkly, yeah? Then, maybe I'm his official food taster. Gotta check if it's too spicy or, eh, poisoned. Then there's finding the best sticks for his fires and sneaking ahead of everyone. We Gubbos are real good at that sneaky stuff. And you bet, any dirty jobs that need doing, Gubba's got it covered. But most of all, anyone tries to mess with Boss Tronald, they'll have a very big problem in a very small package. Joe, what class is Gubba? To be honest with you, he doesn't even have a class. I mean, he's a CR one quarter. Good. So I guess my real question is this. Can I make Gubba my apprentice? You mean train him to be a wizard? Yeah. Honestly, I have no issue with you training this guy up. I mean, the rules as written would make it an extraordinarily long process, but I'm just going to throw them out of the window. If you wanted to take him on as your apprentice, I'd say it would take three days for him to reach the equivalent of level one. Then after that, it would be on him to how far he can progress. And what would his stats be? Once he reaches level one, I just let him have the standard array of stats to use as you and he saw fit. You know what? This is actually quite hilarious. How about it then, Gubba? How about what, boss? Would you like to become my apprentice? I can train you in the art of magic. I can train you to be powerful. Gubba's eyes go wide, practically shining with excitement. Boss? Apprentice? Me? Learn magic from you? That'd be... That'd be the most amazing thing ever! Imagine! Gobba the Goblin! Zapping and casting spells left and right! Oh, the other gobbles won't believe it when they hear about this. Maybe I can even make things float or turn invisible. Or, or make bright lights in the dark. The possibilities. Suddenly his energy seems to fade a bit and his shoulders slump. His voice lowers to a soft and somber tone. You know, I wish my pa Gubba could see this. If he were working for someone like you instead of old boss... He deserves better than the hand he's been dealt. Well, I'd love to be the boss of all you fine gobbos. Hmm. How about this then, Goba? We forget about that special gift that we were going to give to your old boss, and instead we work with you to free and liberate all the goblins from underneath him. After we have done that, then you, Goba the Great, can be the boss of all the goblins. Then we will have quite the team going, won't we? I'll be your boss, and you can be the boss of all the others, managing things for me whilst I'm away. Wow. Is Tronald really trying to swindle his way into becoming the leader of a goblin horde? Shh! Let the man cook! Honestly, whilst I was totally against this at the start, you're managing to turn this into something decent, Tronald. I guess a horde of goblins that are sworn in loyalty to you is better than dead goblins. At least then, my monastery would have a force that would be willing to do the dirty deed to any trespassers where we would be unable to. You're not saying that out loud, are you? Absolutely not. Oi, Boss Tronald, you mean? I'll be Boss Gubba the Great and Magical? That's absolutely right. Blimey! Never thunk I'd have any fancy title, and now I gets two! Yeah, Boss Tronald is indeed very generous. Just so you know, I won't be referring to you as Boss Tronald. But here's the snag. There's a couple handfuls of gobbos, the real uppity ones. Their noggins stuck real deep in loyalty to the old boss. Dunno if they'll switch sides, but the rest, push, hundreds of them. They'd hop over in a jiffy if they see you leading. That's amazing, Goba. I've got every faith that you will be a great boss goblin. Have you got any plans that you'd like to do when it happens? Once as boss, no more raiding human places, no more silly fights. We'll make nice, do some trading. Got loads of shiny bits they'd fancy, and I bet they got stuffs we'd like too. Our horde. It'll get big and rich, but not from snatching, from trading in and working. Ain't gonna be easy, but Gobba's gonna be the bestest goblin boss there ever was. It's at this point Gobba starts strutting ahead with one hand on his hips, swinging his other arm around with a massive grin on his face. Gonna be fair, gonna be good. Gonna watch out for every lil Gobbo. No Gobbo gets left in the muck when Boss Gobba the Great and Magical's running the show. You really can't deny his aptitude for leadership. Aptitude and enthusiasm are two different things, Tronald. Joe, I slap Saxy. That's Boss Tronald to you, peasant. You know, this shit is getting really old. Do they slap you often then? Oh yeah, we've made a whole game out of it now. It's not just the slapping. 
but it's the constant need to cut me off at every opportunity. Well, personally, I think you've done a really great thing here, Tronald. You should be proud of yourself. You're an asshole for that. Thank you. Well, if it's all the same for you guys, I'm going to spend the next few days of travel training Gaba up. I know it was meant to take us two days to get there, but we'll be going a little slower because of the training. So three days should be fine. Are you asking the group whether we're all okay with that or just doing it? Okay, Joe. So I'm going to begin the training with Gaba as we walk. You get used to it, man. I have a whole step-by-step -step plan for him to follow. Okay, so are you wanting it to just happen or do you want to RP it? Of course I want to RP it. I didn't spend the last three minutes writing his training regime down for nothing. Okay, man, just tell me what you want to do to train him up then. All right, Gaba. First things first. Whenever I give you a task or approach you with something, you will need to respond with, what is thy bidding, my master? Uh, okay. But why do I got to say that for? Don't worry about it too much. It's just formalities. I ain't too sure about what this formalities thing is. But if Boss Tronald says it's good, then Gaba's all in. All right, Gaba, listen up because we've got a packed few days ahead of us. What is thy bidding, my master? Today we start with the foundations of magic. We'll dive deep into the basics of magical theory straight away as we're walking. You need to grasp where magic truly comes from. By the afternoon, we'll transition to arcane symbols. You'll learn the intricacies of drawing them as they're the backbone of spell casting. And as the sun sets, we'll sit in quiet meditation, helping you connect with the arcane energies around us. Okay, Joe. As Tronald's going through this with Gaba, I ask him which direction we should be going in, then start heading that way. Gaba briefly breaks his focus, pointing in the necessary direction before quickly refocusing on Tronald's words, hanging on to every syllable. Tomorrow, it will be all about spell casting. In the morning, you'll get your hands dirty with simple cantrips just to get a feel for casting and controlling magic. Post-lunch, you'll practice on target dummies, honing in on your aim and the strength of your spells. And come evening, it'll be study time. I'll hand you a spare spell book, your very own spell book, and you'll start memorizing your very first spells. I feel like I'm becoming magical just by listening to you, Tronald. Thank you, buddy. Anyway, where was I? Oh yeah, the final day. On the final day, we will push your boundaries with advanced techniques. You'll discover the vast realm of complex spells and understand how to use magic in both defense and offense during the morning. The afternoon will test you. We'll engage in mock combat where I'll throw challenges at you. This will test your reflexes and your ability to cast spells under duress. And finally, as night approaches, we'll have one last meditation session. If everything goes as planned, by the end of it, you, Goba, will emerge as a wizard. Boss Tronald! That sounds amazing! Gobba's gonna be the bestest wizard goblin there ever was. I can't wait to get started and show everyone what Gobba the Great can do with your teachings. Let's do this! Joe, I'm going to go up front with Saxi and keep a close eye on our surroundings for any indication we're going in the right direction or any danger we might be heading into. Okay, if you two want to roll either a perception or a survival check, basically roll whichever one fits what you want to do. So I rolled a 17 on my perception. 15 survival for me, Joe. Okay. Guided by Lunaria's keen vision and Saxi's innate sense of direction, your group winds its way through the gentle embrace of the rolling hills. The rhythmic cadence of your footsteps is occasionally interrupted by the playful antics of a hare darting in and out of the tall grass and the distant call of a falcon echoing as it searches for prey from above. So what's your story then, Saxi? Joe, I fill her in on everything that has happened throughout the journey so far. That's quite the tumultuous tale, yet I was hoping to hear about you, your essence, your history, separate from the adventures with this group. I can discern the lineage of a half-elf, even if seeing one is a rare delight for me. There's a comfort in the presence of kin, don't you think? To be honest, I feel more tethered to my human side, not in a physical sense, because that's evenly split. It's just my upbringing was devoid of the traditional elven ways. My parents, especially my mother, the elven part of me, were more drawn to the world of cogs and gears than to the rhythms of the forest. She found her magic in mechanics, her wonder in widgets. It's an unusual stance for an elf, I know. But that was my mother. Unusual. I don't think it's unusual at all. The universe has its mechanics too, think about it. The moon that guides my every step. It's not unlike one of your mother's intricate mechanisms ticking away in perfect harmony. And the stars? They're like countless light bulbs, illuminating our path, each with its own purpose and story. Nature and machinery, they're not so different when you look closely. Both require balance, precision, and understanding. In a way, Saxi, your heritage mirrors the universe's blend of chaos and order, of magic and mechanics. It's 
beautiful. That was nice. I've always felt somewhat disconnected from my elven side. Maybe, maybe you could help me understand it better. And um, if you're ever, you know, curious, I could try to show you a bit about mechanics. The merging of two worlds, nature and machine. It would be quite the adventure. Yeah, I think I'd like that. Um, Tronald, what are you doing? Sorry, Joe, I was just watching the latest trailer for Geek Nights. What the hell is Geek Nights? <sighs> You're telling me you haven't heard of them? Obviously, hence why I'm asking. Did you really expect anything different from Saxy, Tronald? That's a great point, Ra. Well, how about you tell me what it is then, rather than trying to get cheap digs at me? I'm pretty interested too. Jamie, pull that up for us. Type in Geek Nights. That's it, that's the one. You regain consciousness. You open your eyes to find you are a prisoner in a rolling cart, being pulled through the forest. dice decide. See, look how incredible this is. It's going to be huge. You know what, Donald? I've got to hand it to you. That's actually super badass. Damn, a series that takes D&D games and turns them into live action? That's wild. Not only that, but they're all professional stunt actors over in Hollywood who love playing the game themselves. So you know they'll do it justice. Yep, they've already got a ton of big names on board as well, including Ed Greenwood. Damn! Oh, and do you want to know the best thing about it? Episode 8 of every season will be based off a fan-submitted campaign. Really? We need to get ours sent across. Way ahead of you. I've already done it. The Tronal doesn't mess around. So where can we support this? You can support it right here. I'll get our editor to put it in the description as well. Awesome. Well, thanks for that, man. I'm going to get straight on it. Anyway, let's dive back into the game. So, why do you act so indebted to Tronald? Trust me when I say that I don't mean any offense by this, but you act like a lost puppy around him. I used to hate him, you know. Really? I can't picture that. Yeah. I mean, at the start of our adventure, I was just hoping that he would die so I wouldn't have to listen to his overconfidence day in and day out. What changed? For a long time, I misjudged Tronald. I kept my guard up, certain that we were too different to ever see eye to eye. But that all changed. I was cornered by a massive zombie bear, convinced I was about to fucking die. But Tronald jumped in, risking his life for mine. And after the dust had settled and the creature was dead, he didn't gloat or boast. Instead, he looked me in the eyes and called me friend. It was then that I understood. It wasn't about proving might or skill or even getting one up on the other. It was about trust. He had my back when I least expected it. Beneath his exterior and our differences, Tronald showed me what genuine friendship and loyalty looked like. And that that's why, Alexandru, I am loyal to him. Not because of some obligation, but because he earned my respect and trust. No, that's not how you draw the elemental symbol for fire, Gobba. What you've done looks like a pair of balls. Try again. Oh, ha! Gobba thought it looked familiar. All right, boss. Gobba will give it another go. And he's patient and understanding to those who others may not be quite so patient or understanding with. You drew the exact same thing, Gobba, except this time it's got a... What even is that? Again. Yeah, I can see it. What about you, Alexandru? Clearly you have great respect for that turtle man, but what are your ambitions for this life? Don't call him that. But yeah, he's a great man. The best I've ever met. 
and I just want to make him proud. So do you plan on taking the baton, so to speak, from him and become the leader of your temple? If Master Shenzhou saw me as worthy, I could imagine no higher honor. And there you go, Goba, that's perfect. I'd say you're ready for tonight's meditation on what you have learned today, channeling all that knowledge and storing it at the surface of your brain so it becomes as natural as breathing. All right, guys, with Saxi and Lunaria leading up front, the otherwise tranquil journey is interrupted as around the fifth hour, the cerulean expanse above becomes tainted. A slender wisp of smoke rises, threading its way into the sky, its origin concealed by the undulating landscape. As you continue, the previously fresh air grows thick with the biting tang of burning timber and underbrush. Above, crows form a dark tapestry, their synchronized circling and harrowing caws hinting at an unseen disturbance just beyond the next hill. Uh, Joe, can I make some kind of check to discern whether this is a natural fire or not? Yeah, sure. Roll me a nature check. That's a 16, Joe. Lunaria, as you take a deep inhale, drawing upon your connection with nature and the surrounding environment, the scent of the smoke fills your senses. The dominant aroma is certainly that of burning timber, reminiscent of forest fires or hearths you've encountered before. However, beneath that, there's a subtle, troubling undertone. A faint, acrid scent of charred flesh is unmistakably mingled with the wood smoke. This isn't just a natural fire. Something or someone has been consumed by the flames. Um, guys, I think we should proceed with caution over this next hill. Someone or something is burning and the odds of that being from their own free will are pretty low. How far away from us is it, Joe? You gather that it's maybe another 20 minutes of walking. What do you want to do, guys? Are we going to see what's going on, or shall we go around, avoiding it? I think going around it when there could be someone in danger would be extremely cowardly. So yeah, that's my vote. We see what's going on. Yeah, that's fine by me. I don't disagree with that statement. Yeah, let's go have a little gander. Okay, Joe. We make our way towards the plume of smoke. As your group makes its ascent, the world before you slowly unfurls, revealing a landscape painted with both beauty and sorrow. Cresting the brow of the hill, your eyes settle upon a sizable farmstead, its structures punctuated by the remains of what once must have been a bustling mill. The scene, which might typically hum with the vibrant rhythms of daily farm life, now resonates with a heavy, oppressive silence. At the heart of this tableau, a gargantuan pyre blazes fiercely, its flames hungrily reaching for the heavens, creating a smoky veil that blots out the sun. But it's the fire's tragic fuel that draws your attention. Twisted forms of livestock, their once living bodies now reduced to silhouettes in the fire's dance. Standing sentinel around this mournful blaze, about half a dozen figures appear almost like statues. Their postures tell a story of deep weariness and heartbreak. Dressed in the humble garments of farm folk, their faces bear the marks of recent turmoil, eyes lost to the distance or fixed on the ground in despair. Every now and then one of them, with heavy steps and reluctant motion, adds another animal to the fire. Oh, so there's not actually any issue here then. It's just them burning their own livestock. And that doesn't seem strange to you? Strange or not, it's their business what they do with their animals. I say we make our way around this area. No need to waste any more time. Animals aren't mere possessions to be discarded on a whim, Alexandru. They breathe, they feel, just as we do. Using them for sustenance is one thing, but this... This is something else entirely. There's more to this story, and I intend to find out what's really happening here. Well, it looks like we're going down there then, Alexandru. Chin up, though. I doubt it will take us too long. All right, Gaba, pack your stationery away. We will continue our studies after we have dealt with whatever this is. Packing away as you speak, boss! All right, Joe, we make our way down and see what's going on. As your party begins its descent toward the farm, the true extent of the devastation becomes heartbreakingly clear. All around, the lifeless bodies of cows, sheep, goats, and other livestock lay strewn across the fields. The air is thick with the mingling odors of blood, singed fur, and charred flesh, now weighing so heavily on your chest that it becomes an incredibly difficult task for some of you not to heave. The sorrowful murmurs of the people tending to the remains only add to the somber atmosphere. Amongst the group of people, one figure stands out. A tall man with grizzled, sun-beaten skin and the broad shoulders of someone accustomed to hard labor. His eyes are dimmed by fatigue and sorrow, shadowed by the lines of recent tears. Dressed in worn leather boots, simple brown trousers, and a dirt-streaked white shirt, he begins to walk toward your group with the slow gait of someone bearing a heavy weight. At his hip rests the worn handle of a farmer's blade. He offers a sad smile, a ghost of friendlier times. 
I'm afraid Clearbrook Farm is closed for the foreseeable future, friends. You'll have to look elsewhere if you're looking for a roof over your heads. However, as his eyes land on Goba, that fleeting moment of warmth vanishes instantly. His face contorts, twisting from one of muted sorrow to raw anger and disgust. His voice, previously resigned, takes on a sharp edge of fury. What is that creature doing with you? Oh, that's just Ra. He's actually quite a friendly guy if you get past his intimidating presence, his anger, and his lust for food. Well, it's good to see you're still shit at making jokes, Saxy. You're nothing if not consistent. Ha, <laughs> well, I thought it was quite funny. Well, I suppose it would be to someone whose history of humor is based on what jokes squirrels and boars have told you. Well, dear, I'll have you know that there are some squirrels out there with a far better sense of humor than certain big grumpy beasts I could mention. I don't believe you. Go on then, tell me a joke that one of these squirrels have told you. Ha, okay, um, so how about this? Why don't squirrels wear pants? I don't know, Lunaria, please enlighten me. Why don't squirrels wear pants? Because they'd have too many nuts to fit. Ha 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 ha. That was so funny. You're actually almost as funny as Tronald. Oh, you really think so? No, it was shit. Joe, I step forward and walk up to the man bringing Gaba along with me. We're with this goblin because he's a great guy, so please stop with the fucking racism because I've just about had enough of it today. The defiant set of the farmer's shoulders relaxes slightly, replaced by a mix of surprise and weariness. His gaze, once piercing with anger, now seems to be holding back a reservoir of sadness. Well, stranger, you have to understand what we've been through. This used to be a thriving farm, passed down through generations. Every animal here was treated with love, and they gave us their best in return. But last night, a horde of goblins, not like your friend here, came upon us. His voice breaks for a moment, but he continues. They raided without mercy, laughing as they went. Some animals they took, while others they just just slaughtered in their wake. It wasn't even for food. Their weapons were tainted with some kind of vile poison, rendering the creatures inedible. The meat's tainted, and we've been forced to burn them. Such waste, such senseless destruction. He swallows hard, eyes glossy as they drift over the bleak scene. We barely survived the raid, hid in a trap door cellar beneath our home. My family and I listened to the chaos all night, praying they wouldn't find us. So you see, stranger, after witnessing such devastation at the hands of goblins, you'd forgive me if I was taken aback by seeing one amidst your party. Well, I guess that's fair. What did these gobbos look like, human? The farmer takes a hesitant step back, his gaze darting between Tronald and Goba. For a moment, it was as if he might refuse to answer, but then, after taking a deep breath, grounding himself, he speaks. Well, I ain't one to know much about goblin differences, but there were about 30 of them, all sneering, cackling, and creating chaos. Among them, though, three stood out. There were two bulky ones, almost the same size, like twins. They were clad in some makeshift metal armor and always fought side by side. Their faces were alike, brutal and filled with malice, carrying those big spiked clubs of theirs. And then there was one draped in robes, bones, and other trinkets, tattoo marks all over his body, and he was wielding a staff. Looked to be made of bone. This one didn't charge in mindlessly like the others. No, he was calculating, chanting, and calling upon some dark magic. Those three were calling the shots, directing the rest of the horde as they wrought destruction upon my farm. How did you know what they looked like if you were underground? I may have popped my head up once or twice to see what was going on. Oh, I see. Gubba's eyes widen with a spark of recognition. Oh, them! Them be mud and slud, the nasty twin brutes. They ain't got two brain cells to rub between them, but what they lack in smarts, they make up for with brawn and ruthlessness. And the robed one, that's Braga, a dark shaman, they say. Calls on the bad spirits, does the wicked rituals, and makes the other gobbos afraid. Trust Gobba, they as nasty as they come. Real bad news, those ones. But that be precisely why Gobba the Great is gonna overthrow them. Gobbos deserve better than following those horrible lot around. With me as their leader, Gobbos will have a better life, away from the dark magics and mindless destruction. Time for a change in the Gobbo world. The farmer's eyes widen with a mix of surprise and hope. Wait a tick, you lot are actually out to take them down? Going after that horrid bunch? He pauses, clearly reflecting on the weight of recent events before straightening up with a newfound determination. If you can rid these lands of that menace, you'd be doing more than you can imagine. They've been terrorizing us for far too long. You and me both, Mr. Farmer. I'm from the Monk Temple, Sanctuary, about eight hours from here. 
That's why we That's why we wanted to seek them out originally to bribe them off his lands and offer them a deal. As it turns out, we met Goba and we quickly realized that instead of bribing them, Goba could instead be their leader, making things better for everyone. The farmer rubs his chin thoughtfully, taking in your words, Tronald. So, instead of dealing with the devil you're aiming to replace him, it's a bold plan, and I have to admit it's better than anything we've hoped for. Having Goba here as their leader might just be the change these lands need. It's at this point he glances up at the dimming sky, noting the encroaching shadows of the evening. It'll be dark soon. I can't offer much, but you're more than welcome to stay with us tonight before you continue your journey tomorrow. Not as paying customers, but as guests. And... Well, maybe there is a selfish part of me to ask this from you, but it would certainly ease my mind knowing you're close by, just in case those creatures decide to pay us another unwanted visit. Well, I guess that depends. What's on the menu? The farmer's face brightens a little, and he gives a small chuckle. Well, I reckon you're in for a treat, my large friend. Those gobos might have taken our livestock, but they missed our reserves. We've got salted pork, seasoned and preserved to perfection. Tender cuts of lamb that melt in the mouth. And if beef's what you're after, we've got hearty chunks that have been marinating in a blend of herbs and spices. There's also roasted root vegetables, crusty fresh bread, and pots of rich, thick gravy to drown it all in. I'd wager it's a meal fit for kings, or at least a band of hungry adventurers. All I can say is that I hope you've brought your appetite. My mouth is just a torrent of drool at this point, Joe. I want all of it. I want bloody all of it. The farmer chuckles, looking raw up and down. Well, judging by your size, I'd say we'll be lucky if there's any left for the rest of us. Come on, let's get you all settled in. We follow his lead, Joe. He leads you through a sturdy wooden door, which groans slightly under its own weight. The room inside is cozy, the golden hue of torchlight reflecting off polished wooden beams. The warmth immediately envelops you, pushing away the evening chill. The earthy scent of timber and hay mingles with the distant aroma of herbs and cooking meat, promising a delicious meal soon to come. To one side, a series of pallet beds have been laid out, each piled high with straw-filled mattresses and blankets that feel soft to the touch. There's a comforting quiet in the room, broken only by the occasional pop from a fireplace that, that crackles merrily in the corner. The walls are adorned with farming tools and family portraits, giving a sense of the life and history of this place. Settle yourselves in, the farmer says, pointing to the sleeping arrangements. The food will be ready in about an hour, just enough time to freshen up and relax. As you begin to unpack and settle, the farmer takes a moment, looking at each one of you with misty eyes. Listen, I can't begin to express my gratitude for what you're doing. Every night I tuck my daughters into bed, and the thought of losing even one of them, it's unimaginable. You're not just protecting us tonight, you're standing up for every family in this region. You're heroes, true heroes, not because of what you're capable of, but because of the choices you make and the people you choose to stand up for. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. We never got your name, sir. What should we call you? You can call me Harland. Well, Harland, rest assured that while we're here, your family and land will be safe under our watch. As the sun rises tomorrow, we'll set out and ensure that the Horde won't be a shadow on your doorstep ever again. Sleep easy tonight. As Garland shuts the door, you hear his footfalls fade into the distance. It's at this point Goba leans in, his beady eyes scanning the room around him before looking up at you, Tronald. Boss Tronald, this place still got lots of shinies, yum-yums and munchies. Goba knows Gobos. They like to grab everything, not leave nothing behind. My senses say, high chance they come back tonight. Want to finish what they started, grab the rest, and, heh, finish the job. Goba, I hope with every fiber of my being that they do decide to come back tonight. You've mentioned the presence of three lieutenants in last night's raid. If we can confront even just one of them here, that's one less blade at Snagglegut's side when the final confrontation comes. A split force, after all, can be picked off far easier than a collective one. As you all take this next hour to rest in the quarters which Harland and his family have provided, you each find a brief respite, washing away the dust and grime from your journey. The wooden floorboards of the house seem to have a gentle give beneath your feet, reminding you of its age and history. A few stray rays of the setting sun filter through the curtains, casting the room in hues of gold and amber. The scent of food slowly begins to waft through the air, and it's at that moment a firm knock resounds on the door, drawing your attention. Harlan's face, wearied but with a hint of pride, peers in with a welcoming smile playing on his lips. The meal's ready. 
Hope you all brought your appetites. Absolutely. Lead the way. You're led into a dining area that, while not opulent, exudes a charm born from years of family gatherings. The polished wooden table, surrounded by mismatched chairs, gleams under the warm glow of lanterns. A large window offers a view of the dusking horizon, painting the room in soft twilight hues. Everything is immaculate, each utensil and plate positioned just so. Upon the table lies a feast fit for kings. Juicy chunks of salted pork glisten next to a large roast of beef that's so tender the knife slides through it like butter. Lamb chops, seasoned perfectly, send an aroma into the air that makes your mouth water in anticipation. Bowls of freshly harvested vegetables, steamed and buttered, accompany the meats and fresh loaves of bread, still warm from the oven, sit waiting to be torn apart. Sitting down, you all dive in, the flavors bursting in your mouths, each bite better than the last. It's hard to remember when you last had a meal this delicious. The air is filled with the clink of cutlery, satisfied murmurs, and the occasional request to pass a dish. Amidst the joy, the flowing ale, and the rising sound of laughter, the ambiance takes a sudden shift. The mirth is disrupted by a faint sound, a high-pitched sinister cackle echoing in the distance. It sends a chill down your spines. The laughter and chatter around the table fades, replaced by an oppressive silence as all eyes turn to the window. All right, guys, everyone, go get your gear, and Harlan, keep your family inside. Do not come out no matter what. We will come get you once this is over. So that is where we would usually wrap up this session. However, I've got something very special planned, but rather than me introduce it, why don't you, Mike? Thanks, Joe. Can you all hear me? Loud and clear. Hey, before I go running my mouth too much, because once I get going, man, I don't stop. Why don't y'all check out this clip right here? You just got a peek at something real special. We've got a dynamite one shot lined up and we're breaking it into two killer episodes. For the Patreon fam and YouTube members, you'll get episode one on Sunday, the 5th of November. For the rest of the champs out there, we're divvying up episode one into three rounds, dropping on the 12th, 14th, and 16th. Mark those dates, cause this ride, it's gonna be unforgettable. Trust me. One question, where the fuck was my invite? Sorry about that, Donald. We couldn't have anyone who is a current player in the main campaign participate in this because it will be a part of the expanded universe which will be running alongside the main game. So what you're saying is that there's a chance that we could run into these chumps? Oh, absolutely. Who the hell you calling chump? I'd kick your ass. Dad, you may be the baddest man on the planet in this mortal realm, Mike, but in this game, that title's reserved for me, Tronald. Well, I think we will wrap that up there. See you later, guys.